Good evening, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? I, I like to wander. I tend not to stand in front of a microphone, but we'll, we'll see how we, uh, we make out. So uh, I'd like to, to uh, thank the Institute for having me here tonight, and we'll kind of share some thoughts on crime scene management or the approach of crime scene and kind of the differences between forensic identification versus forensic sciences, and there is a difference. How many people in the audience watch any of those crime scene investigative shows? Okay, the rest of you are all liars. No, so. Okay, so anyway, um, we're going to talk about, as I said, forensics versus, uh, forensic identification versus forensic sciences. And uh, can we dim the lights? Is that possible? So we're going to look at some of the um, misportrayals that we see on, on the television shows. But first off, you can see old Gil Grissom here, and on his hat it says forensics slash ID. Well, we're going to come back to the forensic aspect, but who is it that you would suspect uh, a forensic investigator is going to want to potentially identify related to um, a call for service? Yell it out. Culprit. Suspect, culprit, yes. Who else? Victim. Victim. Anyone else? Reason Pardon me? Reason for death. Reason for, for why they're dead? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's not identifying the person. It's identifying maybe the, the cause of why, they've dece why they're deceased. But it could be other people as well. It could be just passerbys. It could be eyewitness accounts. Many times, crime scenes will take, uh, crimes will take place, and uh, the area of interest is evacuated from anyone, potentially witnesses, before the police are even contacted. So you get there, and all these witnesses have disappeared. So sometimes we need to identify who was there, and then obviously whether they witnessed anything as well. Sometimes, crime, sometimes uh, forensic investigators were called to, to scenes that have no criminal aspect to them. Like, for instance, maybe to assist the, uh, the office of the coroner in just a, a sudden death or an accidental death. Maybe it could be an industrial accident where uh, someone has, has uh, been injured uh, as a, uh, during the course of their work. So then it comes to the point, is it uh, mechanical failure? Is it operator error? Is it a manufacturing defect that needs to be corrected? So we get called maybe by the Ministry of Labor as well, Office of the Fire Marshal. So there's many agencies that forensic investigators will also assist with. Sometimes it's for identification purposes. You're just strolling down the street and a piano falls on your head. Maybe you don't have any identification on you. Maybe there's no one there to, to identify who you are. So it's just as important to identify people that are deceased that are unknown victims as it is as we've talked about some of these other categories. So don't get all excited. You're not going to be seeing any nude photos. Um, well, maybe of me, but no. Um, you are going to see a couple of photos of dead people, just warning you now, but they are, um, I would say, not as sensitive as what they possibly could be. So they're kind of toned down a little bit. So let's talk about the other aspect of this. So we discussed the identification and who potentially we're going to identify, but the word forensics, the origin of that word is Latin, and it basically describes a person's opportunity to speak before the forum or to have their voice heard, to orate in front of a crowd, in front of the Colosseum, for uh, it could even be in terms of uh, uh, corporal or capital punishment for public display of that type of thing as well. But, of course, by modern standards, it's got more of a medical-legal aspect, and it's applying science or scientific methodology to the court system. <clears throat> so as it says here, it could be regarding matters of science for public discussion or argumentation. So I'm going to show a, a, a slide here that has a quote. It's quite an extensive one by Dr. Paul Kirk, who by, is arguably considered to be the father of modern-day criminalistics in the United States. Whoops. And before I, before I show this, does anyone have any idea where the first crime lab was in North America? 
I wish it was Toronto, it's not Ottawa, Mon Montreal. And Montreal, the, the lab in Montreal was fashioned after a lab that was, that was uh, designed by uh, Edmund Locard, who is considered to be the father of modern day forensic sciences. And the laboratory in Montreal was, was set up by a fellow by the name of Wilfred uh, de Rome. And uh, this is back at the turn of the century. And it predated the first US labs, which were the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and the FBI, which came by some 15, 20 years after the original Montreal lab. And they used that as a template when they were designing their own labs. So anyway, I'm going to show this here. We'll read along together here. Wherever he steps, whatever he touches, whatever he leaves, even unconsciously, will serve as silent witness against him. Not only his fingerprints or his footprints, but hair, the fiber from his clothes, the glass he breaks, the tool marks he leaves, the paint he scratches, the blood or semen he deposits or collects, all these and more bear mute witness against him. This is the evidence that does not forget. It is not confused by the excitement of the moment. It's not absent because human witnesses are. It cannot perjure itself. It cannot be wholly absent. Only its interpretation can err. Only human failure to find it, study it, and understand it can diminish its value. Now this was written by Dr. Kirk back in 1960, but it still has, it still rings true today for the different types of, of, of science and uh, scientific disciplines that we're looking for or, or relating to in modern day forensics. So, we come to this. Forensic sciences versus forensic identification. First off, is there a difference? Anybody think there's a difference? Anybody think it's the same thing? Well, there's a crossover here between the two aspects, and we'll just kind of discuss this. So first off, forensic science itself is, is more based on the natural or physical sciences. They're, the people that, that conduct this type of analysis are true biologists, chemists, toxicologists, and so forth. They are generally restricted to a lab. It's not like what you see on television where they're running all over the place, they're underwater dive investigators, they're, repair, or they're checking out cars for, uh, for uh, mechanical deficiencies, and, and the next thing they're working on, on uh, generating DNA profiles from biological samples. You, it doesn't work that way anywhere. It's just, it's all kind of compartmentalized on television because they've only got an hour less commercial time to solve the crimes. So when we look at at this, it's more academic or, or theoretically based. They are true scientists, they work in a laboratory. In Ontario, we have the Center of Forensic Sciences, which has their main, their main lab is down at, uh, uh, it's a new facility on uh, Morton Shulman Drive in the Kiel and 401 area in Toronto. And they also have a regional lab in Sault Ste. Marie that handles the northern uh, submissions. Generally, they do not go to a crime scene unless they're specifically asked to for one specific need. Generally, they work in the lab and they receive submissions that come from the field from what's referred to as forensic identification officers, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So that's kind of their position. And as you can see, there's many disciplines that they cover. Some of them, there's a crossover between both types of forensic investigations or, or aspects of the forensic investigation. But some of these are done on full-time basis. Like for instance, there is a biology section at the Center of Forensic Sciences. There's chemistry, toxicology. There's a Ontario Forensic Pathology Services, which is kind of an extension of their agency. It's, it is separate from CFS, but um, kind of in the same realm. Entomology, for instance, the application of insect uh, uh, life cycles of insects to establish a, what's referred to as a post-mortem interval or the time since death. Well, it's all, uh, it's all very accurate in that timeline or able to assist in, the, in establishing a timeline when a person was, uh, was, was murdered or, or met their demise. But there simply isn't enough uh, of, a, of a caseload in entomology to sustain permanent employment. So on cases like that, entomology uh, and some other uh, of the sciences, they will contract externally on a case-by-case -case basis. Of course, you get into botany, anthropology, um, 
Odontology is another example where they would contract out to a forensic odontologist on a case-by-case -case basis. Some of these, I'll just go back for a second, like shooting scene reconstruction, blood stain pattern analysis, the center is, is basically not doing that kind of thing anymore. They've delegated or downloaded that to the forensic identification officers to, to process the scene. So, we come to forensic identification. It's more of an applied science. It's using scientific methodology in the advancement of crime scene investigation. So, um, for the most part, almost exclusively in Canada, forensic, or forensic identification officers, or FIOs, are police officers. There's very few exceptions. There's only about 1,400 of us in, in, the, in the country, about 400, maybe th about 350 in Ontario. And um, all police agencies, as you'll see in one of the slides, are required to have that. It's mandated by the provincial government in Ontario, as with other legislation across the country, that mandates what police agencies have to provide, and this is one of the agencies. So forensic identification officers are the crime scene people. They are the ones that attend the scene and document that scene so that they can regurgitate that information or metaphorically take that, the, the um, the courtroom and other investigators back into that scene so they understand what happened. So how do they do that? If you were a forensic investigator, what tools would you utilize that would make that doable? What can you do that's going to explain to other people what happened in a scene? Photography, Photography is huge. Evidence. Collecting evidence. So documenting it and collecting it. What else? So it could be, uh, it could be uh, physical evidence, it could be trace type evidence. What else? Looking for people in the community. <coughs> yeah, well, you're right in that it's all part of an investigative team. Generally speaking, in, and we use a homicide as, as a classic example, there is a homicide squad in most police agencies. Well, the homicide investigators are in charge of the overall investigation. The crime scene is left up to the forensic identification officers, so they're just one piece of the puzzle. The homicide investigators would be the ones knocking on doors, writing search warrants, making the arrests, and so forth. The crime scene is left to the crime scene investigators, and that information is given to the homicide investigators. So we work very closely with them, but they are separate agencies. So. I, there are basically, <coughs> excuse me, three levels of forensic investigation in Canada. And I use that kind of as a carte blanche kind of statement, but it's pretty much true across the country. So your forensic identification officers are sworn police officers that attend the crime scenes. They are in charge of every crime scene that takes place in their jurisdiction. But for operational needs, and I'll give you an example, the City of Toronto, for instance, has about 35,000 call, 35, calls for service a year. Well, there's only about 40 forensic investigators that work in the city. There's no possible way 40 investigators are going to investigate 35,000 calls for service. It's just not doable. So to assist them is what's referred to as scenes of crime officers that are uniformed police officers that will not only investigate other aspects of frontline policing, but they will also do minor crime scenes property crimes, break and entries, stolen vehicles that have been recovered, victim photography and that kind of stuff where there's no life-threatening injuries and no trace evidence to collect. They do about three quarters of the calls for service, allowing the forensic identification officers to do the homicides, the sudden deaths, the suspicious deaths, the sexual assaults and so forth. Now recently they've introduced these other positions, crime scene support technicians and forensic identification assistants. And um, York Region Police has got the, the FIA position up and running. They are civilian employees that will process crime scenes. Um, same with the CSST position that Toronto has just started and their first day on the job literally is tomorrow. Um, to show you how that plays into the universities, there are five university programs in Canada that offer uh, honors bachelor of, of uh, science degrees in forensic sciences. There's a university, and you'll see a slide here in a minute, University of Toronto Mississauga campus, uh, Trent, 
uh, University of Ontario Institute of Technology, uh, Laurentian and Windsor. Those are the only five programs. Now, the York Region Police have hired 17 investigators in the civilian capacity and they're utilizing these civilian positions or, or they're utilizing these educated students that are graduating from these programs that ne don't necessarily want to become police officers and then go into a forensic unit because it takes some time a frontline policing service before you're eligible to even apply to these agencies or to these units. So again, we got a great untapped resource that they're just recognizing now. So the FIA position in New York Region, they have 17 employees, uh, five of, let me see here, five of the 17 employees were my former students. Here they've hired 11 and five of them were my former students. So the U University of Toronto has a great uh, history uh, and, and is obviously being recognized for uh, their contribution to the sciences. So let's just talk about some of the differences here. Well, first off, we have this slide here and it just talks about it's a core competency and adequacy standards for adequacy and effectiveness for policing standards and tells you that basically by under the Police Services Act, that police agencies shall, it doesn't say may, it says shall ensure that these agencies or these investigative support units are, are uh, included in their mandate, including forensic identification. It talks about here for investigative support, again, forensic identification is mentioned, it's mandated by the provincial government. Falls under the direction of the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services, and I always show this next slide because I think it's kind of interesting. Governed by these core competencies and adequacy standards is set by the government. So this document, and this is the front page of the document, was created by the Queen's printer. You f notice anything peculiar about it? It's supposed to explain core competencies and they can't even spell the word competencies correctly. <laughs> I point that out every time I get and it just gets people mad. So anyway. Trial of the accused is merely a sideshow. The trial of the investigation is the main event. Justice Watt made this statement. There is more and more dependence on forensic evidence during a trial uh, in so much as many courts will not convict unless they're supporting forensic evidence in a case. So it's under the microscope. I'm not going to bother showing these videos here. It's basically just the opening theme for both of the shows. We've already talked about that briefly. So. But why are they so popular? Why do these programs exist? Well, we just simply look at, you know, this is a random selection from the Nielsen Media Research people, but not even including syndication, there's always something CSI related on television. Excuse me. Everybody's got their own shows, their own favorites. Anybody watch Bones? I love Bones. I'm going to talk about some, some, um, misconceptions in a few minutes and they are notorious for it. So let's talk about what's wrong with these shows. So we have crime scene investigation in the shows versus forensic identification services. So as you can see, they got about 45 minutes of air time. They have to show the crime, they have to show the investigation, the arrest, the interrogation or interviewing, uh, the forensic lab work, and what do they do at the end of every, every episode? They confront their suspect with the forensic evidence and the person gives it up. Every show. You have to remember that forensic evidence is circumstantial evidence. Just because I find a fingerprint at a crime scene or a footwear impression at a crime scene doesn't necessarily mean that that person committed the crime. It just puts them in relation to that location or an item that was in that location at some point. There still has to be other evidence to corroborate forensic evidence. But, of course, on, they always take that leap of faith on television. I have m had many crime scenes. It takes me longer than an hour in city traffic to get to the crime scene, never mind <laughs> wrap it up in an hour. Tests always work and result in a match. I love this one. Now, this is where I'm going to talk about some of these shows. How many, how many people have ever seen the episode on the CSI show 
where they have a body on the, on the slab in the morgue, and the person has a deceased person has a stab wound in the center chest area, and the knife has gone in and had embedded into the sternum, and the knife tip is broken off and embedded in the, in the bone, and the knife is recovered at some other location. Anybody ever see that episode? And what did they do? They mixed up this rubber goop called polyvinyl siloxane, and they mix this stuff up, and, it and it's, it's a liquid form, and it turns into a rubber as it, as it cures. Well, don't they pour this stuff, eject it into the person's chest cavity, and let it harden, and then they pull out the perfect shape of the knife? Well, when you think of human anatomy, is that realistic as to what's going to happen? No, but they just take something that is not intended for that purpose, and they portray it to do something just to make their storyline fit. And uh, it's a classic example. They do it all the time. I saw another example. Now, first off, before I talk about that or get on to that, they, um, we do use those polyvinyl siloxane products. And I might have some with me here today to demonstrate in a few minutes. Uh, we use them for lifting fingerprints off textured surfaces, for fingerprinting cadavers to get friction ridge detail off the fingers once decomposition starts to set in. Uh, it's used for pry marks or tool mark impressions or head stamps on spent cartridge cases to get, uh, to get uh, impression evidence off of a, a, a firearm or, or the ejector and the firing pin from a, from a firearm. So it's used in the field, it's just not used the way they portray it. And another example is, how many times do you see on the shows and um, they'll, they'll go into a, let's say a hotel room, crime scene's taken place, a sexual assault. Horrible, horrible crime. And what do they do? They go in there, and they've got their orange goggles, and they got their blue light. And what are they looking for? I can guarantee what the first word out of your mouth is going to be. What evidence are they looking for? Okay, well, I heard a whole bunch there. I heard semen, blood, and everything else. Okay. It's a great search tool. That's a particular wavelength of light. It's very blue. It, uh, this particular one broadcasts at 450 nanometers. So as far as a general search light or capability for detecting trace evidence, it's ideal. Because it will work for biological fluids, such as uh, semen, vaginal discharge, urine, decomposition fluids. It works for certain hair, treated hair, certain treated fibers. Works for drugs, bone, phosphates and household cleaners if somebody's tried to clean up a crime scene works on bone and teeth, so it's a great search tool. But what didn't I say? I didn't say blood. Yet on every episode of Bones, they've got their light out and they're searching around and they see this fluorescing stain, aha, blood. I've even seen them do it in broad daylight. Blood does not fluoresce. It's the only one that doesn't. It absorbs light energy, so when you shine that light with those goggles on there, it shows dark or black in color which is still useful because even if you've got a dark colored wall, it's going to increase the, the, the uh, contrast because the absorption of light will vary from the background in the blood. Now we can add chemistry to the blood that will cause the blood to fluoresce. We can add chemistry that will dye stain minute amounts of blood that were not visible or minimally visible before the application of the chemistry. But blood does not fluoresce on its own with a light. Okay, getting to our, our, our horrible scene. So you have this sexual assault. Horrific crime in a hotel room. You go in there with a magical mystery light and you see this on TV all the time. They go in there and they shine around and aha, we know it's semen. We know whose semen it is. There's our trace evidence. What do you think happens when you go to a hotel room with one of those lights? The place lights up like Canada Day. Because not only do you get the fluorescence of that contributor, but from everyone else that's been in there since that place has been properly cleaned with a bleach solution. You can wash sheets and they still will fluoresce if they haven't been washed in a bleach solution. So you have to have, you have to take that as a, with a grain of salt as to what, you know, it's an investigative tool, it's not the be all and end all. I went to a homicide scene one time and I took a young fellow with me, a new investigator, and we went to this homicide scene and we're looking for uh, a cleanup where some, someone had gone and cleaned up and they were, we were using chemical blood reagents to try and find where this cleanup had taken place. 
So we go into the bathroom and we start spraying this stuff around and we get this violent reaction. And he's like, holy crap, this is where it's happened. I said, wait a minute. I said, what happens in a bathroom? There's an expectation that there's going to be blood in a bathroom. You've got menstrual blood from women. You cut yourself and you go to your first aid cabinet. Where is it? It's probably in the bathroom. You get men cutting themselves shaving, women cutting their legs shaving. There's an expectation there's going to be blood. So you have to look at it in context, how much it is and where it is. All right, that's enough of that. One other thing. I've got to tell you this. Um, I don't know where I put my... Oh. Anybody see the episode of CSI where Grissom goes into a, a jail cell and uh, an attack has taken place and so he's trying to find fingerprints on the jail cell bars. So he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a jar of Vicks VapoRub, takes the lid off and starts to wave it under the bars. Awesomely, fingerprints magically develop from the vapors that are coming up from the jar. So me like an idiot, I gotta try this, right? I run to my cabinet, uh, my <laughs> medicine cabinet, and I grab a bottle of Vicks, and I go get some metal, and I start waving it under there, and nothing's happening. And then, again, as they take things that don't necessarily apply, I started to think, okay, so what are they, what's the concept that they're going with? Well, we use, cam we use camphor, which is an ingredient in Vicks VapoRub, to develop fingerprints on metallic items, particularly on galvanized metal, but we don't just use the vapors from Vicks VapoRub, we ignite it, and I'm gonna do a demonstration, time permitting. So, anyway, let's carry on here, a little bit longer here. So, sometimes things just don't work, but not on television, it works all the time. So you end up with this effect called the CSI effect, you may be familiar with it, where there's an expectation by the courts as to what happens because they're, they have a preconceived motion, notion from watching these television shows. And they wonder, well, they do it on TV, how come you can't do it? Well, it doesn't always work that way. Uh, I won't worry about that one. Sometimes uh, they, they go off in different directions. They get great locations, the lighting effects, fantastic vehicles. They're all like movie stars or whatever else, right? The places that we go into are not the worst, are not the best, right? They're usually bug infested places. You get a lot of entomological activity for deceased people. And if anybody smelled a dead body, it is not a pleasant thing, especially once uh, the de decomposition starts to get to the advanced stage. Has anybody seen that before, where someone starts to purge? You know what I call that, the, that purge? It's decomposition fluids, but I call it stinker juice. But anyway, anyway moving on. They, yeah, it, well, it does work. Some people put a little dab under their nose there to kind of mask the smell. Um, they portray themselves, as we talked about, about doing everything on television. And it's simply not that way. If I need an anthropologist, or I need a botanist, or if I need a biologist or a, f a fiber expert, I will call them and utilize those resources as necessary. To give you an example, when it comes to collection of evidence at a scene, so suppose you go to a scene and you collect what you believe to be a blood sample. So you maybe do a presumptive test at the scene, to confirm its blood, you send it into the lab for an analysis. You're looking for a DNA profile to be generated from that sample. So the forensic investigator will properly handle it, package it, send it to the lab, and a biologist working at the Center of Forensic Sciences will do the analysis, provide expert opinion evidence, upload it to the National DNA Data Bank, and so forth. That's kind of how it works. Now, you're not going to get rich at this job, but it's good. Now, just this one here, it talks about physical match. This is kind of where the, it's more of a, a, the scientific methodology when it comes to uh, crime scene investigation goes, in as much as forensic identification officers will process evidence of, an, of uh, impression type evidence. So fingerprints, tire tracks, tool marks, footwear impression evidence, we will do our own expert opinion evidence and present that in court. So again, we work very closely with the center, but we each have our own responsibilities. So we operate a, at the university, we have these internship programs. It's called the, the course is FSC uh, 481. And it is a course designed for um, exposure. It's almost like a cooperative, but students have to do a research project and has to have some relevance within the forensic community. So it's kind of cool. 
get to do all kinds of neat stuff. It's a great stepping platform for people to go into med school, law school, teachers college, uh, working in private and public labs and so forth. We get the opportunity of doing research. I just had dinner with this young lady tonight. She's my former teaching assistant at the university and we're just doing this project now using fire extinguisher discharge in clandestine marijuana grow labs to try and find fingerprints. That's awesome. You just go in with a fire extinguisher <laughs> and just let loose. It's awesome. Anyways, one of my former students as well, uh, uh, Amber Minocchio, she is now the assistant manager at Forensic Pathology. Well, we did a project together where we were looking for fluorescing, uh, looking for human remains in an accelerated fire. So we would put little dead piggies in our house and burn it to the ground and then go in with a laser to try and locate it. And what happens is the soft tissue and bone on the body, even though the entire body is blackened and maybe just skeletonized, it will still fluoresce under an alternate light source or particularly a laser. It looks like glowing embers, but it's not. There was no, there was no color other than black when it, uh, from the uh, original appearance at the scene. So we're going to do some demonstrations. We're going to try to do some stuff here today. Fingerprints on skin. Uh, there's two facilities that teach the forensic identification uh, uh, program in Canada. Regardless of what your uh, undergraduate uh, uh, degree is in, um, it has to be either the, the Canadian or the Ontario Police Colleges are the only places that teach the program. So let me just see here. I think, anybody, anybody got any questions so far? You guys want to see some demonstrations before rather than carrying on with this? Okay. Can we get some lights on, folks? Is that possible? Okay, let me get this cranked up here. There we go. So this little tool is simply a butane torch. Of course, these companies will take a product and convert it into something they refer to as a a forensic tool, and it's like anything in the marine industry. If it says marine product in front of it or forensic product in front of it, they jack the price up. Yes? It's minimal. Yeah, we're not going to burn, we're not going to set the alarms off or anything like that. <laughs> but they got raincoats anyway, they're okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to put this on. Basically, what this, what this tool is, it's called a, fu a glue fuming wand. Now, if you've ever seen on any of the television shows, they sometimes they'll put an exhibit into a glass chamber and they add glue into a dish and they heat it and you see this white smoke inside the chamber and then fingerprints magically appear on the items. Well, what that is, it's crazy glue or super glue products, which are cyanoacrylate is the actual technical term for those products. And so cyanoacrylate, when it is heated, it will uh, vaporize, and the vapors that uh, are let off from the, from the heated glue will polymerize or plasticize on whatever item it is they're exposed to. So you don't want to be breathing this stuff in. It's not very good for your health, unless you want to turn your lungs to plastic. So this, takes, this is a, a field unit here that can be used in more of a, an uncontrolled environment. Obviously, it's better to take a, an exhibit from the field, take it to the lab and process it in one of the proper chambers, but sometimes that's just impractical. Maybe transportability is an issue uh, and uh, potential damage to the evidence might, might be an issue. So the reason why we would maybe use something like uh, uh, the cyanoacrylate over some of the other techniques is on items that are potentially slippery that may cause just a simple brush stroke of a, of a fingerprint brush may wipe a fingerprint off a surface. Another example would be on a contaminated surface where maybe, um, maybe uh, on a, say, a beer bottle or a pop bottle where you have residue on the outside. Well, it's going to be impaired by using a, uh, a fingerprint powder brush because what happens is the, uh, the powder has an affinity to moisture, whether it's a residue or whether it's fingerprint secretions, so the powder is going to cake on the entire surface. 
Also with handguns or, or long-barreled weapons where you've got gun oil on them or you have uh, anything, drug, uh, drug bags that have drug residue. This is probably a better option because it doesn't stick to the background like the other development techniques. It targets the latent fingerprint impressions and polymerizes or literally turns the fingerprints to glue. So what I will do is I'm just going to put, I'm sweating pretty good here, I'll put a few prints on, on here. And you can see, as it's heating now, you can see that it's starting, to, um, it's starting to vaporize from the top. And so you simply just expose the exhibit to the vapors of the glue, and it's going to turn the, the fingerprints to glue. So there is a bit of a curing process that goes on with this, because it is vaporized glue, so it has to cure for a few moments, but once it cures, the fingerprints turn to glue and they can't be removed. So they can be dye stained with certain dye products and then forensic light sources can be applied for photography purposes. But that's basically how that works. So, and it, this will increase over the next couple of minutes. I'll just do it quickly here, but um, we'll set this aside for a few minutes and we'll have a look at it shortly. I'm just gonna let that go for a second. You're gonna see it waft in a second here. Can I ask you to do me a favor? Can you plug our iron in for us? It's not just any iron. It's a forensic iron. Yeah. So many of the, the, uh, the types of development techniques that we have, whether it be cyanoacrylate or whether it be powdering, and, uh, powdering techniques, they, um, they are used for non-porous surfaces. So we talk non-porous surfaces, it's where the fingerprint secretion stays on the surface and is not absorbed. So I'll just do a quick demonstration here of how quickly fingerprints will develop. So I put some prints on here. I'm going to use what's referred to as a granular fingerprint powder in conjunction with one of these fiberglass filament brushes. So it's very sensitive, very fine powder that's used with this, and um, it doesn't take very much of an application to develop the fingerprints. Let's see here. I know it's difficult to see. I'll, I'll set this aside so you can see it more clearly after the fact, but there's a cluster of fingerprints that I just deposited right there. So it, de it, it develops really quickly. It has an affinity to that moisture. Now let me just, while this is just vaporizing here, I think our flame went out. Okay, we'll leave that. But anyway, we'll have a look at that again as well in one second. Let's see if this is going to ignite again. Okay. Um, our bottle. Now, I don't know whether you can see that from a distance or not, but you can see the, the, there's actually fumes that are vaporizing around where the fingerprints are. So I'll let, for some reason that shut off. I'll let that sit for a second. So other than using the granular powders, another type of fingerprint powder is this. It's magnetic fingerprint powder. And it and it's, has the same similar properties as the granular powder, except it has iron filings that are mixed in with it. And so it's used in conjunction with a magnetic applicator. And it's simply a tool like this that has a center plunger that has a magnet attached to the bottom of the plunger. So when it's depressed, it magnetizes the tip. And because there's iron filings mixed in with this, it will pick the powder up like a ball. And so you can use that as if it's a paintbrush. And you simply just brush over the surface and the fingerprints will develop like that. The beauty of this is because it's heavier powder, uh, it doesn't get airborne as easily and you can reclaim the excess by reactivating the magnet and then just putting it back into your container. Now to lift those impressions, again after it's properly marked and labeled and so forth, you just use fingerprint tape and it doesn't matter whether it's granular fingerprint powder or magnetic powder, you simply put the tape over top of the impression after it's marked up and photographed, and you lift the impressions with the tape off the surface and then put it onto a backing card, and that's how it's kept. Okay. 
Let's shut this off. It's not going to get any better. I think the powder's almost, or the product's almost exhausted. Okay, how's our time here? We've got a couple more minutes. Now, I talked about Gil Grissom and his camphor smoke, or sorry, his, um, his um, uh, Vicks Vapor Rub. Who's got, uh, I need a volunteer here for a second. Somebody, because I'm kind of sweaty. I want somebody who's got half decent. Come on up here, sir. Can, do me a favor, just kind of rub your forehead and then just put a couple of fingerprints on there. Just lay them out flat there for us. Perfect. That's great. Okay. So, I'm just using this as a demonstration, this type of metal. It's normally galvanized metal that this kind of excels at. But the idea behind this, as, as I kind of discussed earlier, is camphor is... Uh, I'm not doing crack cocaine here. Let me see where my... I had a spoon kicking around here somewhere. Okay. I'll put it on here. Okay, so I have some crystallized camphor. And so with this here, you simply ignite it. It lets off a flame, it lets off a soot. You simply expose the exhibit to that surface. Be very or, careful with the amount of smoke that's in it there. The amount of what, sorry? Smoke yeah. Going up yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. Once it's totally covered like that, you simply take a clean-out brush and you dust away the excess and the fingerprints are revealed underneath. So this is, as I said, predominantly used for galvanized metal. So electrical components, chain link fencing, vending machine coin boxes where, you know, expo exposure to uh, to um, uh, ele elevated humidity or moisture levels, that kind of thing. Uh, what else have we got to show you? How much more time have I got? Oh, it's uh, 8.20. Okay. So I, I have 10 minutes? Is that right? Okay. How's our kettle doing? Okay, we talked about the polyvinyl siloxane products there before. So what we're going to do is I'm going to fingerprint somebody. I need a volunteer. Anybody want to finger? Come on up down here, sir. So this particular product here, it uses a dual barrel cartridge such such as this, and it goes into this uh, into this injection gun, and attached to the tip, we put a helix mixing tip. So these uh, two products remain neutral as long as they're separated, but once you squeeze them down, uh, you start to squeeze the trigger, it ejects equal amounts through this helix mixing tip so that they come out mixed. So this is a medi medium body consistency. So as I said, it's used primarily for fingerprinting dead bodies, but we'll be able to see the amount of detail that it picks up. Again, this is the th a similar product to what they were using on the CSI show that, you know, obviously was falsely represented when they were doing that casting of the, of the, the, um, the knife. So a couple of things here. Uh, just kind of hold it up so, and don't touch your clothes with it because it, uh, it'll come off your finger no problem in about five minutes when it sets. You don't have to, just don't, just don't hold it against your clothes because it won't come off. Um, and if you feel faint, because it is toxic, don't worry. It's, just, <laughs> it's uh, You'll probably be all right. We can call the medical services and let them know what happened. No, it's not toxic. Yeah. So anyway, so let that sit. We'll have a look at the detail that that, uh, that, that gives us in a, in a couple of minutes here. Oops, I better get in trouble here for leaving that over there. Okay. Um, now, how's our, our iron doing? Is it hot? Okay. So one thing, I've talked about all these items here, these techniques that work primarily on... Um, porous or non-porous surfaces. Okay, so this is what's referred to as an amino acid reagent. Now, I need somebody to just put some fingerprints on here for me. 
Got another hand? All right, come on up here. Rub your forehead. Put your hands down there. Leave them down there for a few seconds, okay? So just rub your forehead, plop your hands down there. Leave them down there for a second or so. So people will secrete differently depending on different things such as stress, anxiety, uh, physical uh, health, physical exertion, dietary habits, gender, and so forth. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to simulate somebody. Okay, that's great. We're trying to simulate somebody that has had, you know, um, some type of stress. Oftentimes when we get, you know, scenes of crimes, the perpetrator knows what they're doing. And um, so their elevated stress or anxiety levels when they're committing the offense. So we find very strong secretions from their fingerprints at the points of entry. One of the other things is when they're uttering fraudulent checks or hold up notes or anything like that, if they're barehanded when they're doing it, they will leave very good fingerprints behind. So the issue is, is that the other techniques, the powders and the cyanoacrylates and so forth that, and the camphor all work on non-porous surfaces where the fingerprints are still on the surface. But porous surfaces, such as paper, it gets impregnated into the paper. So we need something that's going to react with smaller uh, quantities of amino acids, fatty acids, and lipids that are within that paper. And so we use products like ninhydrin here, which is an amino acid reagent. So it hunts out that acid and then has a chemical reaction with it. Now, ninhydrin, if there's any prints on there, hopefully we got something on here, will develop what's referred to as Rumen's purple color. And uh, it requires elevated heat and humidity. So that's where our iron comes in. So normally it's put into a, a chamber and that chamber will, will control the heat and humidity levels because ideally 80 degrees Celsius and 65% uh, 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 relative humidity is ideal. But obviously we don't have that kind of control, so we're going to improvise here today. So we've so saturated the paper with the, or with the uh, ninhydrin, and we'll set that aside for a second. And we're going to add our heat and humidity with the iron and see if we have any luck. So first off, I'll just zap it with the heat. Make sure that it's on linen. No. And now we'll add our steam. Maybe I'll just iron it straight away here. Hopefully we'll get some reaction now. Yeah, I, uh, I did ironing the other day and I just, my wife just couldn't believe it. Okay, so I'll leave this up here. This is chemically treated paper, so we can't be passing this around. But you can see the fingerprints here are, and the palm area is developing. So, and that will continue to develop over time. Depends on, he's not under any stress, so there's not as high a concentration as there potentially could be. But it's a good, uh, it's a good starting point, so it's a good example. Okay.